In a space too far from anything to be nothing, a blue light shines into the void. Through the shadows, shapes appear. People, stories, wonders, and mysteries. Live from Elgin, Illinois at the Blue Box Cafe, it's Tales by the Blue Light. I'm your host, James Wilder. So, (laughs) thank you. (laughs) But first, we have a special treat today. I've been practicing contacting the dead through different mediums, not like people mediums, like ways of doing that, like tarot, Ouija, categories, and I've managed to get a message from a famous historical figure exclusively for this show here today. That figure is the one and only Grigory Rasputin. Yes, you have heard that right, folks. So let's see what he had to say here. <laughs> I said I practiced. I never said I was any good at it. Right. <clears throat> well, back to what we I actually have a degree in. Calling stories from across time, space, and reality through a blue light. It's a really good college education. So, let's see what the light is called from the shadows today. Ah! Our first story today is a little horror piece we're calling McMansion Hell. I'm just really glad we didn't get an old house. Old houses have ghosts, you know? I tried to ignore my boyfriend. He was a good guy, and I was happy to be moving in with him in this house together. But the guy really could use a reality check sometimes. Ghosts aren't real, Mark. He frowned. Not this again, Yennefer. I let it slide. He worked a good job. He was loyal. He always did little thoughtful things for me. And most importantly, he was prepared to marry me if it looked like I'd get thrown back over the border. If the guy wanted to be delusional about the supernatural, that was his business. Still, his predilection towards new houses hadn't been one I disagreed with. The house was only a few years old, part of a big subdivision project that never took off during the Great Recession. Technically, the term was McMansion. The house was made of several overlapping boxes, the roofs sloping into each other. There were two entirely separate areas on the second floor that had about a foot and a half of roof between them. You could look out the windows from one section of the second floor onto the wall and one quarter of the window on the other side. It was amazing, and I loved every illogical bit of it. The inside was even worse, with two living rooms right next to each other, and bathrooms seemingly everywhere. There was a toilet, just sitting by itself, in the kitchen, right between two countertops. I loved it! The house was like Wonderland, surprises at every turn, and no corner without an oddity. Mark didn't actually like that aspect of it, but he got to have his no-ghosts policies fulfilled, so he was fine with it. Things started out fine. We slept in our bed and felt the heat unevenly come on during the night. We woke up and made pancakes in the strangely structured kitchen where corners came too early and everything was in the way. We took a walk through the nearly empty neighborhood and made lunch. We watched a movie in one of the living rooms and that was when it started. Is there something in the next room? Mark asked. I listened carefully. I heard the sounds of the movie we were watching coming from the other living room, just a second behind. It must be an echo. This is a weird old house. It's not old. It's not old at all. That was the point of buying it. It's a weird new house then. It must be an echo. It's just the movie we're watching. Look, I'm going to go get some popcorn and you can pause it. He paused it. The sound from the other room continued. Okay, very funny, Mark. Cool joke. He didn't look like I'd caught him at some big prank. It's not a joke, Yennefer, he whispered, and rose as quietly as he could from the seat. There wasn't much to grab, but he found a box cutter we'd left lying around from the move, and we started into the second living room, walking along the edge of the wall till we turned the corner into it. There, like a mere reflection of our viewing space, was a TV playing a movie. The captions on it were in Spanish, just like I liked, but the words and pictures were reversed. In the couch in front of the TV were Mark and I. We turned our heads from the couch, turned them too far. The other me said. 
Her eyes were in the wrong place. Her mouth was where her nose should be. Her shoulders misaligned. One of her arms drooped over the back of the couch, and she pulled herself over it, dropping onto the floor and crawling towards us, dragging one leg behind her and the other leg out of place with a knee high up like a spider. Stravrit in sudru, other Mark said. Jesus Christ, real Mark said. Run, I said. We bailed out of the room and out of the front door of the house. A light went on inside. Another room lit up. Then another. Then one by one the lights went off. What the hell just happened? I exclaimed. Was, was this some sort of prank? We don't know anyone around here, Mark, and if you know someone who could pull off, pull off whatever that was, well, I wouldn't like to meet them, honestly. Should we? call the cops? Oh yeah, undocumented Mexican calls the police because she saw herself contorted and crawling at her speaking gibberish. That will go over real well. Mark rubbed his forehead. This is like something out of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Whatever it is, I'm not sleeping in there tonight. I'm sleeping in the car. He put his hand on my shoulder. We can't avoid the house forever, but let's avoid it till morning and call the realtor. Yes, I'm sorry, but you did say you weren't concerned with what the previous owners of the house had left it for. I growled. You said it had been abandoned during the recession. During, not because of. You're a real piece of work. You signed the contract, and it's a darn good deal you got on it. He couldn't see me gesturing wildly over the phone, but he did it anyways. Do you have any idea what we saw in there last night? Some sort of vivid hallucination. We reread the contract. You're liable for any sort of poisons or gases still on the property, and since you're claiming that what we saw was a hallucination, you don't have a record of that. I'm recording the call, Chico. Oh, of, of course. So are you going to pay for all of the damages for that, or? He sighed long and hard. The things the previous residents saw were monstrous, but that was years ago, and the building has been cleaned and checked for toxins. The place is safe as can be. Well, clearly not. There are a lot of doors on the place. I go around and check to make sure no teenagers got in during the night and felt like scaring you. There's a lot that people can find on the internet. It wouldn't be hard to learn what you and your husband look like before you moved in and to know what you were moving in and when. He's not my husband yet, but, but fine, I'll go look. But if they're all locked, we're talking again. And if they aren't all locked, it was my turn to sigh. Then I guess we'll see how it goes. I walked around the house. I rattled every doorknob and checked every window till I found a side door on the far side of the house that pulled open with only a light turn of the handle. No noise, no bother. I cursed. The teenager explanation wasn't as baseless as I'd hoped. I locked the screen door and we checked every room in the house multiple times till we were exhausted. We sat in one of the two living rooms, the other blocked off with furniture and boxes. No sounds came from it. I'm pooped. I guess I'll go brush my teeth, I yawned. All right, see you there in a sec, Mark replied. I began brushing my teeth, watching myself in the mirror. I looked normal, that version of me, twisted like a Picasso painting. I was horrified. I leaned down to spit, and when I stood back up, I was holding a piece of paper. That is, the me in the mirror was holding a piece of paper. Get out, it said. The other me flipped it over. We're not alone. I took a step back, then bolted out of the bathroom. The floor misaligned with my feet. The carpet seemed to go every which way. I turned the corner and found a hallway. I ran down it, but the end was only another hallway and then another. I opened the door and found myself in a kitchen. My kitchen, but wrong somehow. I ran through it. The words and the labels on everything in it were backwards. It was the mere image of my kitchen. I kept running and got into the living room where I was standing. I said. I don't know what you're saying, I replied. She grabbed a marker and wrote on her hand, then held it up to a mirror on the living room wall. You have to leave. That was when we heard it. The crawling, squelching sound. The lid on the toilet in the kitchen popped open, and a hand slopped over the side. My hand... The me and me shoved me through a door and we ran together, the thing crawling out of the toilet and following us, its wet hands slapping on the tiled floor of the kitchen. Me, me yelled. I could guess what she meant. 
We tried to follow the hallway. We began to run along the walls. The boxes on the floor falling onto the walls. What was down suddenly shifted. We reached a dead end with the stairs, and we ran up it together. There we were, together, on the first, second floor of my house. I could hear the slap of the twisted knee pulling itself up the stairs. I ran to the edge of the room and looked out the window, to the quarter window on the other side I could see. The room looked normal, and through it, I could read the words on the obnoxious poster I had bought for that room. Live, laugh, love. The words weren't mirrored. I looked at this room and saw the same poster, but with the words mirrored. It seemed obvious what I had to do. I opened the window. Me and me grabbed my arm. She yelled. I shoved her back and climbed out the window. The house began splitting in two, and I could see the twisted me shambling towards me and me. She looked back at me one last time, a look of betrayal on her face. I grabbed onto the window of the other side and opened it, crawling in. As I did, the house finished splitting with a crack. My near self and I stood on the one second floor each, and the thing screamed. It tore at its face, flailing its limbs on the floor and scratching at a devil's eyes, before both our houses tumbled over, sending me falling against the wall, and the twisted me out the window, where it flailed in the unending blackness I dared not look upon longer than a moment. I had feared that me. I had hated it. Hate looking back on it now in its final fate. All I can feel is an awful and cold pity. I woke up in the room on the second floor, Mark holding me. What the hell happened, Yennefer? Your arm is broken. It's like you fell out the window. I sort of did. Of the other second floor, he raised an eyebrow. Did, did you hit your head or something? That's a really weird thing to say. The, the house, you know, has two second floors, a little bit apart from each other with windows that don't line up. Two living rooms. Okay, maybe we should get you to a doctor. Yennefer, this is a normal house. It's always been a normal house. I looked up and out the window. Birds were sitting on a tree branch singing a song. No second floor in sight. I guess I must have hit my head, or maybe I was just dreaming. That seems more likely, all things considered. It's certainly a weird dream. <laughs> Come on, let's get you cleaned up. We could just use the toilet in the kitchen. He looked at me like I was mad, so I didn't say anything else as he led me to the bathroom. With the day finally over, I went to the bathroom again and ran the water in the sink. I put my hands in it and splashed my face, hoping to wash away the memories. But there she was, staring back at me, her face scowling. She held up a paper. You left me, mere me. And she walked out of the frame. It's a, stuff to a tough story to tell or to remember. No one believes me, and least not until they stare into the empty mirrors that await me everywhere I go. A friend who I never knew I could lose. Thank you. All right, so we thought we'd shake things up a bit here for the second episode, and we're going to try a little cooking segment. I've got here the world-famous chef from the Land of Elves, Galalus the Stout. Welcome, Galalus. Hello, mortal. <laughs> so I hear you have a recipe for us today. I have prepared it with the knowledge that it will be made by foolish humans. So I have tried to remove the finer elements of elven cooking. Um, wow, I, I guess you guys have been around for a while. So uh, wh what's this recipe? Are you prepared? Yes. Are your tiny ears prepared for the glory of the recipe of Golalus? Yes! Good. Then let's begin. First, get a bowl. Bowl. Okay, check. Excellent. Excellent. Now get a leaf of lettuce. Lettuce leaf? Okay, got it. Excellent. You have prepared the dish. Excuse me? Did you have trouble following it? I can repeat it. No, no, it's just, that's not really a recipe. Well, if you can't appreciate the fine art of elven cooking, then I have nothing more to say. Good day to you, sir. Well, uh, that could have gone better. Ugh. But it does lead us into our next story of fantasy creatures run amok. So we may as well get that going. This is a little fantasy story I like to call The World Was Bright and I Was Used to Darkness. The world was bright and I was so used to darkness. 
I remember the days when humankind would clutch each other around campfires to try to blot out the harsh cold of the world, the deep shadows that came when the sun lowered itself from the sky. I didn't understand the changes at first. So long it had been since I'd left my forest. I looked up the stars and asked the doe, looking her young nearby, why there were less. Didn't you know, she said, the humans brought the stars down from the sky. What a dangerous practice, I thought. Those things had to be very hot. But what big changes the hair had to have been that humans could pull stars down from the sky. I knew other things were changing. When I went to the creek, I found metal cylinders washed up on the banks, strange sets of flexible six-ringed creations that seemed to be made to hold them. There were rectangles made of pulped trees and many other oddities too numerous to name here. The forest had trouble digesting these items and turning them into soil, which was another issue. Most troubling, human maidens used to come into the clearings and glades of the forest in order to dance for me before their bonding ceremony to another human. It was always a highlight of my week. But now they did no more. The only humans I saw were young ones who dressed in strange furs and lit rolls of some plant on fire and stuck it in their mouths. Then they would usually start coughing and insult each other or say they needed to go home to their mothers or start kissing. They always left the stubs of their burned plant sticks on the ground. Heathens. I'd like to say that it was this worry which brought me out of the forest finally, but I'm embarrassed to say that I simply continued on as I had until one day I wondered what had happened to my friend in the next forest over. I hadn't stopped in to check on them in several hundred years, and they were probably a bit worried about me. So one day I walked over to the edge of the forest and decided to cross the prairie to the next forest over. What a shock awaited me, for there was no prairie and no forest forest. The edge of the forest was a fence made of thin cords of metal with a sign that read, No Trespassing. It wasn't a worry for me as I simply cut through the fence with my horn. But what was beyond it was shocking. There was no forest, no prairie, only a long, flat stretch of painted rock on which were big boulders of metal. Human structures rose up in the distance, and I wondered how so many trees had been lost. Where did the humans hunt for their food? <laughs> Stepping into the strange flat rock, I clomped through the rows of colorful metal boulders. Then the strangest thing happened. A metal boulder began to come towards me. Its front lit up with small stars. I staggered back, surprised, and the boulder came to a stop. Then its side opened up and a human came out of it. It was the strangest thing I'd seen. The human pulled out a rectangle and held it up in front of me. Was it a treat? I decided to try to taste it. But when I bit the rectangle, the human began to run and cry. It crunched in my teeth and I spat it out. It didn't taste very good. It shattered on the ground. Walking around the boulder, I found a parent human with its young. Mama, look, a unicorn, the human foal said. No, Betty, unicorns aren't real. That's a horse someone put a horn on to make it look like a unicorn, the mother replied. I'm afraid you have been badly informed, parent human. I am a unicorn, protector of the eastern wood and defeater of the seven-headed troll of Troclophane. They seemed very surprised I could speak. <laughs> the parent's mouth and eyes opened so wide I could have fit my hoof in them. There has to be some sort of hidden speaker around here. This some sort of a prank YouTube show. I don't know what a YouTube show is, but I can assure you the speaker is not hidden. It is in front of you. In order to emphasize the point, I caused a triple rainbow to appear behind me. Oh my god, the parents said. Ah yes, you recognize Noah's sign to God. I am glad of this. It would be worrisome if all things like that have been forgotten. Can you fly? The human child said. <laughs> I laughed. Of course not. I do not have wings like my Pegasus cousins. I can only jump 50 feet in the air from a standing position. Much farther if I have a running start. I looked down at the child's water. It was dirty looking and bubbling. Is that a witch's potion? It's a Coke. It's dangerous. Allow me to purify it. I touched the cup with my horn and removed all impurities from the water, making it crystal clear. I could also turn it into wine or the blood of Christ, if you so desire. I thought a moment. I may also be able to manage mead. Hmm. The parent looked down at the cup. You're really a unicorn. A real unicorn? What a silly question. Of course I am. I shook my mane, causing the sound of an angelic chorus to play behind me. I've got to call my husband. That made sense. I was her local unicorn, and she had bonded with her mate without dancing in front of me. She probably wanted to see if they could arrange a second bonding ceremony. Frank, Frank, listen, you'll never believe what Betty and I just found. No, we didn't find your socks. 
What do you mean don't look in the box in the closet? Frank, forget that I mentioned that? Uh Uh-huh, yeah, I wish, buddy. Look, we'll deal with that box later, but right now I've just found a way for Frank Carlson Water to be the best thing on the market. I was led into a big building, where small suns were trapped in the ceiling and on top of vases throughout it. As I entered, several humans tried to tell me no animals were allowed in the building. I then explained to them that all creatures were animals, and that they should not think that they were higher than the squirrels in the ground, simply because they could make more words. Then I caused the plants they had in the pots around the room to grow and bloom, and they seemed to relent. Next I was led into a box that seemed to raise me up high into the sky. When we got out, I was led through the building into a room where there was a large table with lots of humans gathered around it. With windows looking out over the land below, I announced my presence with the sounds of the forest and a light but pleasant angelic choir. So it's true. Unicorns are real, a human said in wonder. That's not what's important here, Joe. What matters is what we can find a way to use this unicorn to advantage. I mean, think about it. This thing has the power to purify any water it touches. We can make billions. How much water, though, another voice asked. I can purify a pond, but not a lake. I can purify a stream, but not a river. I can purify a cup, but not two cups at the same time. The humans looked at each other. It could probably purify a holding tank. Unicorn, do you want to help us? I looked around the room. Of course, all creatures should help one another. Okay, great. How'd you like to help us purify drinking water no one can currently drink? It was a noble pursuit, so I agreed to it. If I could help the humans drink healthy water, that would be a true and honest service to them. They got a big cart that attached to one of the colored boulders that seemed to be made to fit horses. Unicorn's physiology is slightly different, but it was similar enough that I could travel comfortably. They took me over to where great metal cylinders rose from the ground, connected by catwalks. This is where the toxic waste from our plants goes that we weren't allowed to dump in the river because it was causing children to die or something, one of the humans said. Can you clean it up? I'm glad they didn't give the death water to children. The human looked like he was going to reply, but another human covered his mouth. Perhaps he was going to eat something he shouldn't. I walked up the stairs to the top of the first metal cylinder and dipped my horn in it. It was very, very dirty, but it was important work, so I focused all of my magical might, and I moved on to the next one and then the next. Soon all of the tanks were full of pure, clean water. The humans followed me as I worked, looking in awe as I cleaned the tanks. I can't believe it. Soon we'll be able to rival all the big water bottles. The humans looked at each other, but only if we can keep the unicorn, I laughed. (laughs) I must be headed on. I have to find where my friend went. But it was a pleasure helping you get your water clean, so you can give it to children and they don't die. One of the humans ran off then, holding a black rectangle to their head. Silly little guy. As I tried to leave the area, a group of humans wearing black shells on their heads and bulky black clothes tried to block me leaving. Stop it right there, unicorn. You're not going anywhere. Oh, you must not have heard. I'm looking for my friend, another unicorn, who lives in the forest that used to be here. Have you seen them? You're going to get back in the trailer. Are you going to take me to see my friend? The humans conversed with each other for a moment before answering, Yes. And so I happily clomped my way over to their cart and walked into it. It was a pleasant enough drive, but unfortunately the sights out of the car were fairly boring. More metal boulders moving along vast expanses of flat rock. What a dull world these humans lived in now. The nature of the rock, after some study, seemed to imply they'd crafted it themselves somehow. Why did they choose it for it to look so dull? I was led out of the cart into another building, where the door was shut behind me. The unicorn is in the building, I heard a voice announced from the searing. Security will tranquilize it before we dissect it for study. Oh no, I said. There's been some mistake. I'm being taken to see my friend. What sort of crazy miscommunication had happened that these humans were thinking I was supposed to be cut up? The poor creatures were so silly. I felt bad for them. Their buildings had white, boring walls and boring gray carpets. Didn't they miss living out in nature where you could at least look up at things and smell interesting smells? Oh well. I would have to make sure I wasn't cut up, however. More humans with black shells on their heads ran into the room and used some sort of automated slingshot they called a gun to shoot darts at me. The darts had a toxin in them, and so I purified their contents into water before they touched my skin. Silly humans. Then they started firing little lead pellets at me. They hurt. How mean. I mean, I healed the wounds nearly instantly because unicorns have magical heroing powers and they should have known that, but still, ow! I was forced to defend myself. 
a task which I wished I didn't have to do, but one that is necessary when other beings cause you harm. I charged the humans and skewered their guns with my horn. Then I reared up rampant and clocked them on the head with my hooves. I kicked back after I landed my front hooves, knocking two humans back who had tried to sneak behind me. Then the door opened, and another human appeared with a big tube on his shoulder. It shot out a net at me, but I slashed it apart with my horn. The human with the tube cursed repeatedly, and they shut the door, but I cut it down with my horn and stepped over it as it fell. I began to get the impression that these humans had never actually meant to bring me to my friend. They had done something terrible, in fact. They had lied. Lying is when you tell another being something that you know isn't true, and you should know never to do that, or the being you do it to might have to dismantle your entire facility as punishment. I prepared to charge and began running through the building, tearing through walls and upending tables. There were other beings in the facility who were being experimented on, cut apart or run through mazes or injected with toxins. So I cut them all free, letting the apes, mites, cats, and other creatures flee the building. The humans were terrified of me, and my horn glowed red hot with justice. Human, I said to a cowering human in a white coat, where is the leader of this endeavor? The human pointed out the window at a tall tower in the distance. That's the headquarters of our company, Argyle Corp. I thanked the human and leapt through the window. I charged towards the tower, my hooves the speed of lightning. I zoomed past human structures and leapt over fences. Then I took a running leap, jumping hundreds of feet into the air to crash through one of the high windows of the tower, where I landed in a room full of humans gathered around a table. Your misuse of the world around you is at an end, Argyle Corp, I said. Th th that's two floors down. This this is TechRecorp. Oh, sorry. Um, my mistake. Where are the stairs? I asked, and they politely pointed where to go while cowering. I walked down two stories and walked into the room I'd seen before. Your misuse of the world's at an end, Argyle Corp. They were stunned to see me, and I walked onto their table. I don't believe you've been entirely honest with me. Now how about you tell me what's really going on? The human at the head of the table was fairly sweaty and was holding up a strange bottle of water that had a picture of, why, it was me, a unicorn. I recognized the material as the same kind that didn't rot in the forest. Now, human, what are you doing with that non-rotting bottle? That's bad for the environment. Look, unicorn, we're sorry, but whatever we've done, you will regret. He backed up against the window, unsure of where to go. Other people in the room got up, hoping to escape. If you leave this room, you will regret it more than if you stay. I approach the lead human, my horn low. Do you know what I can do with this horn, human? He shook his head. Purify. I touched his heart with it. I return to the forest. I'm not sure where my friend is still, but I hope he's okay. I touched the hearts of every human in that room, and they all turned things around. I don't really like keeping up with the petty works of humans, but I did check up. Their company has changed to try to save the world rather than destroy it. I work hard to keep my forest clean, and I still look up at the stars. For all the darkness, what a bright place this world still can be. Thank you. All right. And now we have some special guests this week. Neil Logan. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. So, um, all right. Can you guys introduce yourselves, please? Mm -hmm. Sure. I'm Melissa, and um, I'm one of the co-founders and editors of Neologian Literary Magazine. Mm -hmm. My name is Liz Melvin, and I'm also a co-founder and editor and contributor. And contributor. Mm -hmm. uh, so what do you guys do uh, at Neologian? Sure. Well, it, this is actually, Mark 1 is our first volume, so it's our first edition. We just started it off this year, um, so we're hoping to do a biannual release of new and fresh work that takes old ideas and looks at it in a new way. Right. So just across many multiple genres, so everything. So there's some poetry, there's um, some visual art even, you know, for non-writing, but, and then there's also fiction, non-fiction, mm -hmm. there's some critical commentary. Um, our first issue has, like, you know, spans just a wide range of different things. There's a, there's a, a story about a, um, PTSD, but told through Greek mythology. So there's just a bunch of different things that, a bunch of different, different ways that the work is presented. Yeah, so what are some of the ways you're trying to, um, twist how these things are presented? That sounds really fascinating. 
Sure. Well, <laughs> so I inherited a book of runes from my grandmother mm -hmm. about a year and a half ago. And um, it's the idea that you can take the runes, which are ancient markings from Germanic languages, and pull one a day, and it would kind of... Uh, <laughs> 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 Sorry about that. Yeah. We Oh, yeah, we, we, we just okay. adjusted the mics up here <laughs> for those listening. Um, so with the runes, you can pull one a day, and it kind of gives you something to meditate about and to think about direction. So what we decided to do with the Neologian is we would pull one rune that would be the theme for the entire um, episode or mark, we call it. So um, when we ask for submissions, we ask people to think about that and to have that inform their work and so that we can kind of take an old idea, like journey, or fire, and reimagine it, and reimagine what it means now, and, and look at it from different perspectives. Right, and like, I also like the concept of assimilation, so if mm -hmm. there's different ways that you could take different elements from different cultures and use them in a different way. So the runes are, are Celtic, they're, but they're taken from the Germanic alphabet, and um, yes, she inherited this bag of runes, and that kind of um, has helped, you know, we, we thought that'd be a fun way to, to at least structure mm -hmm. this and have a different theme. So Rado is our first one. That's Journey, Travel, and Communication. Um, our next issue that we're working on will be coming out in July. And that one is Kano. So not not uh, the Mortal Kombat <laughs> character Kano. Um, but Kano, which is opening light, fire, torch, enlightenment, um, knowledge. So that's, that's what our loose theme is going to be structured around. So anybody, you know, can submit something that's like with you know hopefully it ties in in some way to, to the one of those sure but themes. It, and it can be anything it mm -hmm. can be poetry it can be playwriting it can be critical commentary so it really just takes it and looks at it from all these different angles and you end up what we found in this first mm -hmm. edition was you end up finding something that you maybe didn't think of it before yeah can you give an example of that yeah, so, okay, so even just the word neologian, so people, you hear of like neologisms or neologists, so that's basically when you use a word that already exists, but use it in a way that hasn't been used before, or when you create a brand new 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 word, so, um, you know, so some of the, th like Google, like, but you know, Google, yeah. Me yeah, it's like, it wasn't just meant a number, um, you know, way back in the day, but then now it becomes like this ad, you know, this this verb to search for something. Um, or, you know, a troll is like somebody mm -hmm. who's rude on the internet. But before that existed, that wasn't used in that way. Um, and now we have like other words like that. So neologians or neologists, so those are some, that's someone who adopts new views, um, someone who creates new words. And an interesting fact is Shakespeare was mm -hmm. actually a neologian. So some of the words, um, that he coined and he was the first person to use are things like amazement, bloody, countless, critic, um, generous, laughable, obscene, scallywag. So it's just kind of taking that um, and expanding off of it and hoping to do yeah, yeah something yeah, like that. Yeah, and, and that's what we're looking for in the submissions when we read them, too. So, you know, for example, um, in Rado, The Journey, one of the submissions was a poem about lipstick and how she basically put on red lipstick and it took her back in time to her youth and how she thought of this once as her mother's color and how it's hers now and that journey and that's not you know that's something through a very specific item or um one line that comes to my head from another piece that was submitted was um uh, in jake carey's piece where he's giving a character description and he's describing this guy and he basically is like well I'm not going to judge because I don't know how acne chooses its victims. And that for me was like, yeah, I never thought about that yeah. as like a curse or like a li like acne being kind of a mythological beast that attacks people. So those are the kinds of ideas where it's like, okay, you're, you're turning me on my ear a little bit and we want to read about that. Yeah, so you guys are editors on this book then. And contributors. And, and contributors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We, yeah. so this is our first self-publication. So, um, Ooh. We're learning to set deadlines and stick to them with mm -hmm. no one else holding us accountable. So our um, <laughs> our submission period was incredibly short yeah. for the first one. Um, so, yeah, we did yeah. work. Um, we went to grad school together, so we worked on the, like a publication as part of that as well. And I think we, that was like a great learning thing for us. And then we were like, well, if we're doing this here. Um, but that was also coordinating with like 30 people. We're like, well, what if we want to do what we want to do? And then we just have creative control over it. So, yeah. What, what kind of obstacles did you find as trying to do this, you know, just with your own creative control? Cause that's a lot of freedom, but it does also mean that, you know, 
um, as someone else who's done like work by yourself, you can often get into a trouble of excess without. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the one of the biggest reasons that Neologen actually came to be um, was that we pulled in tiebreakers. So um, we have another contributor, Colleen, and and once she came around, we started making a lot of headway because, you know, we were we get along very well, and so it's like I don't know whatever you think or I don't know whatever you yeah. feel, and very femme of us. And um, she, you know, she would come in or Jeff Pizek, who's another contributor to the Neologen, um, we would go to him and say, you know, we're kind of. We like both ideas. What do you think? Yeah, he pretty much talked us out of naming this publication the Gnarly Neologian. <laughs> <laughs> so I think for like, there was a minute we were yeah. like, we want to be the Gnarly Neologians. And he was like, nope, nope, yeah. just Neologian. But um, we also, the Elgin Literary Festival, mm-hmm. So that's and that's actually how we met Chris, um, was takes place annually. This was the third year. And Liz and I have participated in the last three years for Elgin Lit Fest. So we were like, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had this done in time for the literary festival so we could talk about it, so we could, you know, sell copies of it. And that almost didn't happen. There were about four different times I'm like, that's just not going to happen, and we're going to have a table, and I'm just going to have to tell everybody that we sold out because <laughs> it doesn't exist. <laughs> but it, we pulled through. I mean, there was a couple late nights in there, some fights with our computers with CreateSpace. Um, yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah um... You know, this is an aspect of your creation that is, you know, really valuable to talk about because so much of uh, what's being made today that's really valuable creative work is being done independently through self-publishing. Um, so, you know, this is your first time doing that. What, you know, so what were some of the struggles you ran doing that for the first time? Sure. Well, I think I think if you're going to go through a more traditional venue, you have a lot of help with marketing and getting your name mm-hmm. out there and linking to things. And something like this, you have to really decide um, how much of your funds you can contribute, how much of your time you can contribute, and then you're kind of doing the marketing on your own. Um, and being that we're both writers, we're both creative, we have the vision Neither one of us have business savvy, really. I mean, yeah, that's, we totally we, need that's a been a struggle, friend. too. <laughs> oh, we should probably post something on Facebook so people know, you know, yeah. know this exists. Or how many copies should we pay to print and bring to the Lit Fest? And kind of, well, even the taxes was a fantastic hour-long meeting. was like, mm-hmm. well, whose name is it under? Should we do an LLC? Mm-hmm. Um, and you really grow up a lot, I think. Because mm-hmm. when, you, when you're coming to this idea that, yeah, we're going to do a Lit magazine and it it has this really childish appeal of following your dreams. Um, and then you realize, well, if you're going to do that, you really have to put yourself through the paces. And like you said, keep on track and cross your I's and or cross your T's. <laughs> Dot your I's. I'm a creative editor. She's the editor. editor. <laughs> I'm the copy editor. So, yeah, yeah, we, yeah. it's, um, you know, my, like, I, I mean... So, yeah, there was many, many business meetings. We had, like, meetings where, like, we're going to stay on track. This is going to be great. And I'm not going to lie. There were a few of those meetings that devolved into some late-night wine-drinking sessions. <laughs> One entire meeting um, devolved into us trying to figure out our witch names <laughs> via numerology. We found a book about, like, you know, we have a witch name. So, yeah, I mean, obviously you get off track. but Did, did we, you get any good ones? We found some Rose really Marta. good ones. Yeah. yeah. What was your... Rose Marta. <laughs> that, ooh, that, that's I, good. I wanted Agra to work for me from the Dark Crystal, but it, it didn't happen. It didn't, uh, numerologically speaking, it wasn't happening. Yeah. But yeah, um, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So um, you mentioned the Dark Crystal. So let's talk a little bit about your influences. What has yeah. helped you get to where you were creatively? Oh, I have to say first and foremost, um, Angela Carter, Neil Gaiman, and Margaret Atwood. That woman can take a hundred-year-old story and turn it into something incredibly new, and um, I think that was very inspirational. Um, and I like her. I like her whole attitude about getting in people's faces about literature um, and and about reading. And she's done more for Canadian literature than anybody. I mean, it's. I don't think people talked about Canadian literature until she was like, you know, what you should talk about Canadian literature, and and now people do. So she was huge for me um, as far as like that creative. Yeah, I um I tend to lean more towards like I I love like Joan Didion. Um I also love Margaret Atwood. You know, I get to some like pretty nerdy um like <laughs> just literary genre. But as far as um 
I get a lot of ideas from dreams, actually, and I get a lot of ideas from that are rooted in reality. So things that are um, like that take place, like, like we were talking before the show, and um, like my father's from Croatia, and his mother was uh, a witch. She was considered a witch among her people. So I, I've always thought that that was kind of a cool fantasy story, and I always want to try to have like little, you know, try to expand that and create stories around that theme. So, yeah, yeah. So. Do you write about that then in the book? Or uh. okay, yeah, no, that. So one thing that I do love about this project is taking all of these elements and mixing them into other genres that they, you might not expect them to. Right. Yeah. Um. So can you talk a little about that? How you decided to go about that, and what the process of putting that into a story for. Yeah, and for you as well. I mean, I, yeah, obviously, yeah, I, yeah. yeah. No, for this, well, since the theme of this was Rado and it was Journey, I actually um, stepped away from some of the the witch and some of like the more fantasy elements of my writing, and I um, focused on a, a trip I took with my father to Croatia. So it was kind of like a um, we climbed this mountain. My father's also in his eighties, and he's like. You know, I barely keep up with him, but it was just like funny, like being back in that element with him, and and you still, you know, of course, looking in things of reality. So like using like the mountain and climbing the mountain as a metaphor, but also it's part of reality, and then working some other aspects into it. So for this issue, I did that. I'm going to expand to some of the more you know fantas fantastical creative stuff for for further issues. Um, Liz's piece in this issue is. You tell them about that. She <laughs> thought it was weird. I thought it was really high art, and I just didn't get it. Uh, no. No, well, and that's interesting. So, I I mean, I can do, like, nonfiction a little bit, but I usually do fiction, and I'm uh, in that sense, with my own writing, I'm much more um, leaning towards, like, Forgotten Realms type of things, mm -hmm. or, like, the thing I'm working on right now is a piece that takes place in the time where they move from kind of old wives tales and mythology and science showed up and it's like right at that intersection. Um, so, but, but just that whole kind of idea. So the piece that I put in the neologian was actually, it's called a prose poem, but only cause it's too short to be a story. And, um, I've always been really fascinated by the fact that I can only live one life and reading and writing is a way to get into other people's heads. And so for this particular piece, um, I had seen, we had done some work in, uh, when I was at Columbia with the homeless and um, I just overheard some things and some some statements and things that don't make sense. And, and just thinking about like what that perspective might be like when you're you're you know out in the elements and you're not really thinking as the way that you would think if you had somewhere soft and comfy to sleep every night. And I just ha I just had this conversation with this character, and that poem came out. It sounds <laughs> weird. <laughs> and I read it, and I was like. I, I think I just don't get this. This is like high art. <laughs> it's just detached. It's detached. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's like, no, it's, no. No. And, and then we just spend several moments of here just laughing. I'm like, what? Yeah. What was my next question? <laughs> no. Um. I mean. Um. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, uh, ugh. making stories into like different length formats. Um, you mentioned you know it's too short to be a story, so it's a prose poem, mm -hmm. um, which you know that's often a a weird problem with a lot of fiction is, especially when you get a story that is a perfect length for what it is, but it's not marketable as yeah. the length that it is. And in order to like get it to a length that you can sell it somewhere, you have to make it worse. Um, so is that something then that, did you think about it at all? Is that just a happy accident? Yeah, it? I, th I think that definitely came into our mind. I mean, it's kind of that thing of like, um, Doctor Who's a good example. I'm kind of watching it up here on the monitors and you mm -hmm. make a TV show and you hope it's going to run for a season and they probably would have said, well, we're going to run for a hundred seasons and everyone would have been like, no TV show does that. Don't worry about it. And, and yet here they are. Yeah. So I think with our piece too, we wanted to make sure, um, honestly, that it didn't get too expensive. I feel like people budget themselves more on what, on, on like what they're willing to pay mm -hmm. for what they read. Cause you can get so much for free too. It's the other thing that you're up against. And oh, then, right. um, yeah. Yeah. And we didn't, what we didn't want to do though, is we didn't want to kind of edit the pieces after they came in, mm -hmm. right? So we didn't want to do that thing where we were like, this is neat, but can you cut three, you know, 3,000 words so we can have one less page? Mm 
mm-hmm. or yeah. you know make something fit better. Um, so we didn't want to do anything like that. Yeah, there is, um, I think just in different formats, I mean, depending, I think the story typically informs the format and then how, what the length of the story is going to be. So, um, you know, for, in grad school, I wrote a, a series of what I thought was going to be essays and then I had a professor say, well, this should be like a collective story. So that's like, these are chapters and like looking at something as an essay and having it be this like autonomous thing. And it was pretty much what a chapter is, but then there has to be like this through line if it's going to be a broader story. But, um, so yeah, it's, it's, I think it just depends on the theme or whatever topic you're writing about. And then that's going to inform how, what format you choose to use and mm-hmm. then how the length of it's going to be. Yeah. And we did, I made, we made, um, a con- one of the contributors who happens to be a friend of ours, Jake, we made him cut like half of his story and he was like, why? You know, <laughs> you didn't tell me there was a number limit. So yeah, that happened. <laughs> yeah. He didn't read the directions. <laughs> no. He only has himself to blame. Exactly. Yeah. Oh. Well, you've talked quite a bit about this amazing book. Would you like to read us some pieces from it? Yeah, Liz is going to read um, from her prose poem. Uh, only because it's the shortest. It's short and it's fun. Okay. So you guys will see what confused Melissa and see if you guys are confused too. Oh, that's okay. I got it, I think. Thank you, though. Okay, so this is called A Pen, A Bowie Knife, and A Paper Clip. I went to smoke a cigarette and never came back. If they felt abandoned, it didn't follow me. There was something there, though, pushing me out. I couldn't sense the shape of it, but it was large, non-permeable, I think. I didn't push back. When I felt it pressing on me, I just receded. Such a thing must exist with a purpose. I took only what I had on me, a pen, a bowie knife, and a paper clip. That's all I used to build this life. You find me here beside this freeway and the gravel and the hurled cans and life's dust because those little things, well, let's just say that a paper clip doesn't get you very far. The pen may be the only reason I got anywhere at all. You see, I was 16 when I left, toe-headed, robust, a fat little creature craving milk and lollipops. In the pen, I found all the language I needed to speak to the world. He stood before me in terry cloth robes, knotted at the waist with tangible contention, The world, as I knew him, had moon-washed, sun-rumpled hair that felt like angry desert sand, a forest of evergreen bush shaping his ageless exterior into a tired and dissatisfied old man. The world, he kept himself busy by putting batteries in broken remotes from junkyards. He was enamored of all his old systems. There was a particular two-button zenith remote that he would pick up over and over again. He rubbed his thumb on the pale beige beige buttons, dissatisfied that it could only direct up and down, but not in any other inclination. So I held out my little blue paper mate pen to him. I aged a decade by the time he took it, moving it around in the air. The world forgets and causes tornadoes to blow this away when he's not paying attention, until we're hypnotized by the spin. He realized quite by accident that with this pen he could rewrite the story of a nation, a state, a town, a man. And when he tired of that, he pointed the pen at me. He took the pen to me again and wrote in everlasting ink the morbid catacombs of Rome on my left arm. Here I carried death, the weight of each murdered skull biting into my skin. It slowed me, and I learned the language of aging and loss. I turned away from him then. He shook his desert hair, and I could hear the rattle of his fossil mind. He put his warm savanna palm on my neck. The pressure left magma fingerprints. My throat congealed in lava flow and heat. I learned the ethereal language of desire and hope. The heat warmed my skull until it melted into a shield with which I could withstand the heat of falling stars. I turned back to him again, my constellation eyes still strong in the shape of the hunter and the dog. The world smiled with city teeth. A blackout made his lower canine disappear, and inside a wild cavity was fed. He raised the pen again, and this time to my right leg. There he wrote the language of family, the familiar, and diamonds. My toes curled down, pressing their roots into the wet parted earth. The world waved. He dropped my pen into a discarded tuna can and startled three rats whose tails whipped disruption. My left arm began to rise to the sounds of the monks chanting, pyres igniting, and sad bored men digging into my flesh as the tattoo raised my arm until it danced overhead. My body followed my arm, lifting up into the searing cool space where, sp- where stars die. But my right toe was anchored down, still digging and trying to find the core. I was suspended, trapped, and the world smiled as he forced a AAA battery into a Panasonic Universal remote. Finally, he could control the volume. 
The laughter, cries, and crescendo orgasms, last death spasms, and happy birthday blared across the refuse pile. The sound entered my ears, poking, licking, torturing. The last of my youth ran from my nose in a crimson rush. I was stuck, and I could not remain. I pulled the paper clip from my pocket, but there was no lock to pick. I was handcuffed by orbit. When I put the paper clip back into my pocket, I felt the bowie knife. I grasped it and put it to the flesh of the smallest finger on my left hand. I dragged the blade across the muses, tumbled out, followed by the Benfasha, Scheherazade, Plato, Bach, and a hundred other rose-red droplets, each synonym, synonymous with artistic fame. They slid warmly down my arm to my elbow where they pooled in clotting anthologies. The knife met my bone. The calcium fought, then cracked, and my little finger fell away. I sawed through each finger, each cacophony of soggy orchestra still attached to my left palm until all fingers were gone and I was free from the ether. Then I bent down and carved at the root of each toe on the right of my foot. This bled too, but it was thicker and slower and felt farther from my heart. I bled goats, TV, shows, broken blenders, and rolling green mounds of counterfeit cash. I sawed until I was free. The world was too distracted by a mysterious symbol on the universal remote. If you know what the blue button does and you meet the sandy-haired man, please do not tell him what it can do. Anyway, hey, I was free. I dropped the knife and hobble ran, forgetting my right hand behind me. I came to this place with the billboard space for sale. I've just been waiting here, maybe for you to come by. So tell me, have you any use for a paper clip? Thank you very much. This is great. Oh, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. High art or the ramblings of a homeless woman. I mean, that's that's what she was looking what, at there. What's but, yeah. the difference? What's the difference? Yeah. That is one, one and the, the same. same. Yeah. All right. Well, all right. So we've heard from one of you. Would you like to share anything? Or no, no, I, I'm okay. <laughs> No, no, um, no. Actually, the piece that I have in there is it's um is a little more on the nonfiction spectrum, so that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but thank you. All right. Thank and, you. Well, thank you so much for coming to talk to us, uh, for sharing what you're doing. Uh, Neil Logan, you can find them online. Uh, we'll put up a link. Yeah, we'll put up a link for you guys on our Facebook page. Um, so thank you guys so much, Neil Logan, everybody. Yeah, thank, thank you for you. having us. Thank you. Today's episode of Tales from the Blue Light has been brought to you by our sponsor, the Illuminati. With the Illuminati by your side, you're never alone. Ever. You may think you live a life devoid of friends or comfort, but you can take heart in knowing a personally applied Illuminati representative is there for you. Always, at every moment of every day. Feeling like no one cares about you? Your partner has broken up with you? Lost a friend? Don't worry, the Illuminati cares. We've invested in your future. We've invested more than you know. You don't even want to know half of what we've done for you. We have no gods, no masters, and your role in it while small is vital to our long-term plans. Don't mess this up for us. The Illuminati is watching you 24-7 while you sleep, while you eat, and while you try to deny our existence. Our eyes are everywhere, and there is no point in hiding. We will find you because we care. The Illuminati. Because why not try to take a club that historically only scared people for teaching girls how to read and getting drunk on weeknights and make it into a world-spanning titan of fear? Thank you. All right. <clears throat> oh, what's that? Ah. Oh. We're getting another broadcast coming in. Uh, uh, it looks like we have another edition of Monster Hunter Monthly broadcasting live from an unmarked nuclear missile silo in Utah. So I'll just go ahead and get the feed hooked up for you guys. And Hello and welcome to another edition of Monster Hunter Monthly. I'm your host, Magpie Jones, so let's check in on the news. Reports are coming in that a unicorn brought down an entire company. But we all know that unicorns aren't real, so we're having trouble taking that one seriously. Whew. All right, oh, we've got another report in here from Cincinnati, but we all know what that's going to be about, so no point in reading it. Oh, no, we're still completely overrun with monsters, and the Dark Coven of Imahotep has raised the Sullen King from his undying prison of torment in order to rule us from the shadows. Help us, please. Even though we didn't pay our hunter union dues for the last 10 years... Yeah, sure, Cincinnati. <sighs> I'll read it anyway. And Oh, yeah, just what I thought. Um, though we do have word that the Sullen King has started raising an army under his terrible and shuddering mind control in order to try to take over cities accessible by the Ohio River. You heard it first here, Louisville. Uh, it sucks to be you. <laughs> <sighs> 
All right. Um, we also have word that the fairies will be meeting soon to decide whether or not to only buy organic honey. We know organic foods are popular, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, we reached out to the king of the fairies, who said, Who cares? Why haven't I been brought more wine? My minions are useless. Thanks, fairy king. <laughs> We're sure your people appreciate your input. Okay. Um, oh, uh, we also have a new report here from the Son of Sons. If you remember last month, they were tracking down a strange spoke spewing monster. All right, so here's what they sent us. We found a new attack by the monster. The house it hit this time burned to the ground. We found no real clues at the site of the attack, aside from sooty footprints that led away and slowly turned into the footprints of a man. The creature is a shifter. It changes from man to some sort of fiery beast. Under what circumstances, we're not sure. What we are becoming more and more sure of is that the attacks are connected. The houses that have been hit aren't unrelated. They're all from one family, the McCormicks, or our family members who knew them. We're beginning to suspect that someone in the family has been getting revenge on the rest of the family and those around them. It might not even be conscious of the damage it's doing. It's possible a man finds himself reminded of some wrong, and he feels angry. He feels injustice rage. His blood boils, and then the thing inside him takes over. Eating away at his soul, he burns. Then he burns literally. He becomes an inferno, bludgeoning the world around him into soot and dust and smoke. He has no control, only destruction. And then he finds himself alone, naked, his clothes burned to ash. He is cold then, his feet on the chilly dirt. What happened? He checks the news and finds there was another fire. There is always another fire. He doesn't know where to go, what to do. He is lost. But we must find him. If we don't, there will be more death and more fire and more ash. But if we find him, can we kill a man who may have no control over the pain he causes? Is there a demon in him? Or maybe we're only guessing, and he knows very well what he's doing. Every flame is a choice, and every death a smirk. Only time will answer our queries. We search. Well, what delightful verbiage. We always look forward to your reports, son of sons. You guys certainly have a charming way with words. Now, today, we actually have a special guest with us, Taylor Marshall, the ambassador for the American Association of Vampirism Affected Peoples. Uh, hi, it's great to be here with you, Magpie. So, Taylor, we brought you here to talk about vampires because there's a lot of misunderstanding out there about what vampires are, and I think a lot of hunters have the wrong impression about them. Oh, you are absolutely right about that. See, most movies and media make vampires out to be bloodthirsty killing machines who will stop at nothing to consume the blood of the living and drown humanity, a festering pool of their own excesses. Mm -hmm. But that couldn't be further from the truth. Surely, we like to drink blood. But honestly, my NCAA tournament bracket is more important than the overthrow of the, of the living. Go Michigan! <laughs> That you're rooting for Michigan is probably the biggest reason the living have to hate you now. <laughs> oh, very funny. But in all seriousness, human-vampire relations have never been better. Programs to supply vampires with blood from blood banks have been very successful. Mm -hmm. And we've managed to reduce the number of accidental feedings, killings, to a yearly rate that lower, that's lower than the number of humans who die from vending machines falling on them. Oh, wow. So, you, so you're saying people don't need to be afraid of vampires. Uh, absolutely not, Magpie. A lot of hunters don't know that after the great hunter-vampire treaty of 1952, controls and restrictions have led to a lasting peace. Unfortunately, independent hunters who seek to ignore these agreements threatens the very foundation of that peace. It, it's a real problem. I mean, it's not like you guys are werewolves. Oh. Don't get me started on werewolves. Yeah. Oh, look at me. I can walk in the sun, and I only go on the ravenous killing spree every full moon. Werewolves have agreed to no regulation, no controls, and no sanctions. Unlike werewolves, vampires have teamed up with hunters to destroy degenerate vampires who kill humans. Yeah, I mean, um, as this report from... Ow! Oh, oh, are you okay? Yeah, it's, oh, it's just a paper cut. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah, no big deal. Just a nice, delicious drop of blood rising from your fingertip. Delicious and red. Oh, man. <laughs> um, or maybe we should end no, this no, no, interview. No, 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 let's keep talking. I finger we'll still have more to talk about. You mean figure? Uh, could, could I... Uh, could I just suck on your finger for a minute? N no, that's weird. Come on, just a little suck. No. Come on, give me that hand. Achoo! 
We apologize for the interruption. There appears to have been a problem with the broadcast. So it looks like we'll move on with the next segment of our show. This portion of the show was sponsored by the American Association of Vampirism Affected Peoples. We don't want to eat all of you. We just want your blood. So be reasonable and turn it over. So it looks like we have another story coming through here, folks. We have, ah, another message from the 10,000 Dawns in the future. It's good to be getting messages from the future. Just like last week, this one came with a letter. Love what you guys did in the past. Really happy I can somehow get this here through to you in the past because of light or something. Came across this story and thought it would really fit the show. I hope you're all praising the prophet David Bowie and eating your daily recommended dose of olives to stay healthy. Love from the future, Dan from Mars. Well, thanks, Dan from Mars. Let's see what story we've got beamed to us today from the future then. Ah, it looks like this one is called The Taste of Reality. Mary finished zipping up her jumpsuit and stepped through the door into the waiting area where the other testers were there waiting. A woman was going around the room with a device sticking in each tester's mouth, checking a reading, then pulling it out and peeling off a coating on the device and putting on a new one before placing it in the next tester's mouth. She got in place and waited cautiously for the woman to get her. The device went in her mouth and she felt a slight shock on the roof of her mouth. Then it was done. She breathed a sigh of relief and watched as the woman kept up her work. The woman stuck the device in a man's mouth and frowned at the readings. She shook her head and directed the man to leave the room. Whatever they were testing for, Mary was glad she had passed. When the woman had finished, she walked to the front of the room and addressed the group. Thank you for your patience and for signing up to test our new product here at Talanata Softworks. The product we've been developing is, in short, absolutely revolutionary and you're going to be astounded. She pressed a button on her wrist, and a door opened up in the wall through which an orderly was pushing through a cart of awkward-looking helmets with chin straps. Since you all signed non-disclosure agreements on your way in, I can now reveal the project to you, though I emphasize that you can tell no one of the development of this until the public reveal. She picked up one of the helmets and held it out like a floor showman. This is the first prototype of the Talanata virtual reality headset. She looked around, seemingly waiting to be impressed. No one was. A man coughed. <clears throat> um, hardly revolutionary. VR headsets have been around a long time, you know. She smiled politely. They have, yes, but those are pale imitations of this device. You see, until all now, all virtual reality has been a magic trick on your senses. You put on goggles so you can see a fake world. You put on headphones so you can hear it, a nose plug to smell it, a feedback suit to feel it. Your senses are given tricks and mirages, but you still know you're in the real world in a way. You trick and fool, but the strings show in little ways, a sound from the outside, a bump against your real body. Your brain can sense the edges of the world, and it finds the exit, because there always is one. And as long as there is an exit, you will always know you can take off the experience whenever you want. You can never be as immersed as you should be. Our headsets, however, modify the inputs and accept the outputs directly from your brain. You put the headset on. Your brain believes you're actually in another world. There is no trickery, because to your brain, the signals are just as real as the ones you would get from your real body. Your body in the simulation can become just as real as the one you live in in reality. There is no immersion, breaking, exit. Or so we hope. The hardware and software are not perfect, so we'll be running you through tests in order to find the flaws in the system currently that reveal the false nature of the world to the user. Now they were impressed. The testers buzzed excitedly. No one had ever been able to do this sort of test without it being extremely invasive before. A device you could simply put on your head in order to experience that level of immersion? It was incredible. Mary did have a question, though. She raised her hand and was called on. Um... What was the test you had us do for? Uh, well, unfortunately, our current helmet design has encountered a strange flaw. People with the genetic quirk that makes cilantro taste like soap rather than, well, cilantro, are unable to use the helmet properly. Uh, the feed into their brain constantly gets cut off or is riddled with errors. It's unfortunate, but we're working to resolve it and figure out exactly why that's happening. Neri nodded. 
Now, the attendants will come around and fit you with a headset and give you a pillow. Please lie down on the floor, and we will begin activating your virtual experience. Mary was excited. A whole new world. Anything could happen all inside her own head. It was a riveting idea, and she couldn't wait to try it out. The attendant put her headset on, carefully adjusted the stern trap, and then left Mary to get comfortable with the pillow they had handed her. She closed her eyes and shimmied around till she was comfortable. All right, testers, we've got you all fitted. So let's begin in three, two, one. In a blink, Mary was in a deep forest. The trees were rich, but colored pink and blue. The ground was littered in leaves, and small shrubs grew by the path she stood on, with shining diamond fruits hanging from them. She ran over to one and pulled the fruit off. She put it in her mouth, and despite the hard feel against her teeth, her teeth cut right through it. Mm, the inside was a rich goop that tasted like something in between chocolate and raspberries, but not like a mix of chocolate and raspberries. It was like nothing she'd ever eaten before, and she grabbed more of the berries, stuffing them into her mouth. Greedy, are we? She looked down the path to see a leopard, pink and with large black spots over its coat, that each shone with a black light that came out of the spot like a spotlight. Who are you? What are you? My name is Guardian, and my name is my task. Who are you that dares disturb my forest? Mary looked down at herself. She was wearing a blue dress with a white apron over it. She looked like Alice from Alice in Wonderland. Um, my name is Mary, though I suppose I'm Alice. The large cat purred, and his purr shook the grass around it. So then, supposedly Alice... Why are you here? Mary frowned. I'm not sure. Um, let me see if I can pull up a quest menu. Mary whiffed her hand through the air over and over in several common virtual reality menu options. Nothing. Then she tried just thinking about a menu. Nothing. Then she tried saying out loud, open menu. Menu open. Quests open, and many other variations on that. The leopard curled up, its tail dancing behind it, watching her. You're a very curious human, it purred. Are you a witch? I'm no witch, I'm a beta tester. Hmm. I have not heard of the magicians known as beta testers. We were sent here to explore the world and report back on it, basically. The cat rose. I found another like you, then. Follow me. Mary scampered after the leopard, having to hold up the skirts of her dress to run. The world really seemed real in a way no game had felt before. The light breeze ruffled her hair. She could feel the slight shifts of her clothes and the place where the socks met the top of her shoes. Looking above her, eight-winged purple birds flew overhead. Every wonder was really there. It took a conscious effort to remember that this was not reality, that this was a program being shot into her brain by a helmet. It was almost as if when she woke up in that wooded path, the real world had been a dream, and now she was back where she was supposed to be. But that couldn't be right. After all, this wasn't real. She tried to find something that was false, something that she could hold on to to remind her that she hadn't been bored of this land of pink and blue trees where leopards shone like magic lanterns from the holes in their spots. No, this was normal. No, it's not. It's not real. She knew her quest then. She was supposed to find an exit. Something that broke the deep immersion. But as she passed the hanging moss that tasted like cotton candy, she began to wonder if finding that exit was worth it. And that made her worry about being in this simulation at all. She had no control over her own entrance and exit in this experiment beyond the nebulous exit. There was no menu. She didn't need one when everything was carryable on her person. She could pick a flower and put it in her hair, and the flower would twirl in her hair on its own. She couldn't leave and the lack of falsity made her scared. Guardian, what would you do if you found out the world wasn't real? The leopard guardian thought a moment. What was the difference between the real world and the fake world? Well, one is real, and one is fake. But there is no difference in how you see them? None at all. Then why does it matter? Because one isn't real. It's like she looked out over the gently moving fields of ochre grain. It's like if you put your whole life into a board game, 
You set up all the pieces on the board, but someone could come along at any minute and flip the board over. You could start over, sure, get a new board game, but in the end, your memories of it are only memories. You never leave any trace of yourself behind. Does that make sense, Guardian? I suppose. Though I think the one you will meet soon will have more to say than I. As though on cue, actually perhaps totally on cue, they came to a small cottage off the side of the road. A man was chopping wood by the side of the cottage, wiping sweat from his bow with his muscled forearm. Hello, woodsman, Murray called. He stared at her, and then stared at the cat, and then stared back at her. Oh, no, he said. She frowned. What's wrong? Is he about to give me a quest or something? He ran up to her. Tell me you're an NPC, a non-player character. No? Oh, tell me you don't know what NPC means. Tell me you don't know what tolling out of softworks is. Er... How badly do you want me to say that? He put his hands on the sides of his head. But is it true? She shook her head. I'm afraid not. I'm a beta tester to help run and debunk the game. Just like you are. My name's Mary. It's nice to meet you. She held out a hand. He shook his head and took a step back. Oh, no, 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 no. This can't be happening. What's wrong? You don't understand. You just arrived, didn't you? Of course I just arrived. So did you. We're beta testers. Testing the game. No, you don't understand. I'm not a beta tester. I'm an alpha tester. I've been in this game for months now. It was her turn to stare at him. The wind blew a few strands of her hair over her face. That's... That's not possible. Tell me then, how do you expect to get out of the game? How do you leave? Well, uh, you find a bug in the game. Right, because there are no menus. There's no way to escape except to find a bug. And let me tell you, there aren't many. A few of us left when we got here, but most of us accepted we aren't leaving. Started taking some of the empty dwellings around the world, settling in. It can't be that dire. I mean, look, you have to be an NPC. This is part of the beta test, isn't it? He rubbed his forehead. <sighs> well, you're hitting on my theory. The cat watched them both, switching its tail. Your theory about why we're here at all, why they brought us in when the game is already so polished. Look at it. Okay, what is it? He put his hands on her shoulders. A chatbot AI can replicate human speech. It can guess at it pretty well. If you put it in front of a person, it can fool them for a little while into thinking it's a real person, but not forever. Eventually, it'll say something, do something that reminds you that the game isn't real. The only way to make sure the game stays totally immersive is if there are no non-player characters. The NPCs are all real people. But you can't launch a game like that. So you get people to come in for experimental testing, have them sign the long waivers no one reads, and then gradually you have them forget about the world they came from. They stagnate here. They become part of the landscape. Murray pulled away from him. That's crazy, and you're crazy, and that's not going to happen to me. I'm here as a beta tester, okay? I've tested a lot of games, i found a lot of bugs, and I'm going to find a way out of this one. Bye. If your goal here was really to find an exit, then why hasn't meeting me kicked you out of the game yet? When I entered the game, there were real NPCs, and they've all disappeared since we've been in here. Well, except the cat. Hmm. None of them were convincing, but I'm here reminding you it's fake, and you're still here. If you've been here so long, why don't you just, like, die in the game? That should boot you out. You just respawn. Look, you're stuck here. You may as well start dealing with it. She shook her head. Look, you can stay here, but I'm going to go find the exit. You can waste your time waiting around, but nobody would really trap us here in a virtual world. That's madness. He looked at her sadly. Well, if you can't make it out, no, you're always welcome back here. She began to walk down the path and waved goodbye without looking back at him. The cat grinned, a Cheshire grin. Yolanda and Josh stared at their totally realistic hands. Then Yolanda punched Josh. Ow! That hurt! The heck did he... Oh my gosh, that actually hurt! That's amazing! Yolanda laughed. That's what the ad said! I can't believe this VR is so real! It's amazing! Look at those trees! Those are some darn great trees. And look at that cat! I think that's a leopard. I, the cat began, am the guardian... They traveled along the road together till they came across a cottage by the path. Oh, sweet. Finally a building. Maybe we can finally start finding some quests. A man was chopping wood by the front of the cottage. A woman was setting a pie on the windowsill. Oh, hello there, the woman said. My name is Mary. Would you like some pie? 
we'd like some quests. I mean, all this walking around is nice, but we'd really like to start playing the real game. Oh, um, I'm not sure about any quests. I've always been here. Well, then we'll be on our way. Thanks anyway. You know, Yolanda, when we log off, we should go get some Mexican. The cat grinned at Mary and began to follow the two adventurers down the path. She remembered something, something dark and distant that had been said to her in another life, in a dream. Wait, wait, you can help me with something. Cilantro! There are people with a genetic oddity that makes cilantro taste wrong to them. What does it taste like to them? Yolanda and Josh looked at each other, puzzled. Is, is this really the quest? Just answer the question. Yolanda shrugged. Um, soap. I think cilantro tastes like soap to them. Mary hugged her, and as the cat watched, she ran into the kitchen and grabbed the bar of soap from the kitchen counter and held it up to her mouth. Maybe with this, she could make a clean start after all. Thank you. All right. So uh, we end off every show, of which, you know, this is only the second episode, but we'll we, we will be ending every episode like this with a live radio play. Uh, so we have our four cast members up here, and they're going to be performing a little script I wrote. So it's a little ditty you wrote? It's a, li it's a little ditty I wrote. Okay. So are you the newbie? Ha, that easy to tell? Yeah. Look, kid, I've been around the block a few times. You'll do fine. Your first meeting isn't as intimidating as it looks like on the surface, all right? I'm still, I'm pretty nervous. That is totally normal. Totally normal. You read everything in the pamphlets? Only about 800 times. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, I'm shaking in my boots here. And they are nice boots. You polished them well. Thanks. Okay, kid, so... What are you nervous about? Well, okay. So the boss starts the meeting, right? Right. And then we go over the agenda. And the minutes from the previous week. Yeah, of course. Sorry. No, you're fine. It's a lot to take in. Okay. So after the minutes, then we tie the goat to the wooden stake and chant prayers to the sullen king while ritually sacrificing it, right? Yep. You got it. Oh, man. I was worried I was getting ahead of myself there. No, you've got it. Hey, did you bring your knife? Yeah, though I had to go pick one up from Walmart because I lost my cool L.L. Bean one. No one's going to notice. They'll all be too busy saying prayers to their dark god who mercifully deigns to save our souls as the last they will feast on when the dark day arises and the world becomes its rightful food. Right, right. And then we have a coffee break? Right, and you're in luck. Megan brought our strawberry scones! Let me tell you, they almost make me wish we weren't praying to ritualistically end the world. Did I just hear you say that you wish the world wouldn't realistically end? Ritualistically end? Hey, the boss. I I'm sorry, newbie. Try not to get noticed. Oh, yeah. Crap, yeah. Hey, boss! How goes it? I've got that report for you. Yeah, that report was supposed to not even be written. Do you know why? Uh, because we were supposed to end the world? And what still exists? The world? And whose fault is that? Whose fault is that, Brandon? It's ours. Yes, it is. I mean, what's the point of joining an apocalyptic death cult if you aren't going to have an apocalypse, right? Right. right. Who is that? N nobody. Just ignore it. Is that the new recruit? Uh, yeah. Hello. Sorry. It's me. Oh, no. Oh, no, you didn't, Brandon. Um, why? Is there something wrong with me? Uh, you're a millennial. Oh, no, not this again. Back in my day, we had real death cults, not this millennial hogwash. The first cult I was in, the leader killed all the members, and we were stronger for it. Well, how, how are you alive, then? I went to get some freeze pops and missed all the excitement. Now... Why don't we ask the Dark Lord, our Sullen King, what he thinks of all this? Oh, Sullen King, Dark Lord of all, come to us. Oh, hey guys, what's up? My dark and blessed master, you've arrived. Yeah, yeah, I, I went over to the buffet on 10th Street. You know that you can get a steak as part of the meal? Not a high-quality steak, but it's still steak. Really worth the entry fee. My Lord is most wise. Y yeah, I'm pretty okay. My lord, look upon this new recruit. Yeah, okay. I'm looking at him, 
Did he pay his membership dues? Yes, my king, but he is young. Oh, you want me to give some life advice, huh? All right, listen up, kid. When I was a necromancer in, in ancient Babylon, we didn't have indoor plumbing, okay? We also didn't have antidepressants. Things were pretty bad. But guess what? You guys raised me from the dead, and as it turns out, you can get real steak at a buffet now as part of the entry fee. Isn't that crazy? Uh, it's pretty normal for me. Exactly! You guys have all this wonderful stuff. It's crazy! You guys need to take care of this world better. Uh, our mission statement is to destroy it, my dark king. Well, that's a stupid mission statement. You're the sullen king, the dark lord of torment, eater of a thousand souls. Yeah, you know, I got that name in a really dark time of my life. But, you know, I'm seeing a therapist now, and things are pretty good. Like, I'm really not seeing why we should blow up the world. Oh, hey, look at this thing. That's a chocolate bar. Crazy, right? This stuff is mad tasty. You guys should try it. But, my lord. Oh, guys, gotta run. I got a yoga class starting in like 10 minutes. You guys can keep this chocolate bar. Ciao. There he goes. In an Uber. You know, maybe there's a lesson here, guys. Maybe the world is awful and worth ending, but the Sullen King is right. We should still enjoy the good stuff there is, like buffet steaks and chocolate bars. That's a good moral. I'm still all about ending the world, but since apocalyptic death cults are getting too cheery for me, I guess I only have one more place to go. A place where the most degenerate voice where the most degenerate can voice their darkest and deepest wishes, where lies fester and no one can tell hero from villain, a place I can really do my work again. Where's that? Twitter. (laughs) (laughs) All right, thank you all very much. And that's all for tonight from the Blue Light. Come back next month where we'll be sure to offer you more tales for the fantastic. You know, the darkest depths of your horror, the brightest flights of your fancy, and the biggest dreams of your future. From all of us here at the Blue Box Cafe in Elgin, Illinois, keep your lights shining and there's plenty more to see.